A former police officer who shot and killed a teen on a streetcar testifies. Tonight, James Forcillo speaks at a coroner's inquest. What he says would have changed everything on that summer night more than 10 years ago. Good evening. 18-year-old Semi Yatim died during a confrontation with police in July 2013. Today, the former Toronto police officer found responsible testified at the inquest into the teen's death. CTV's Scott Lightfoot joins us live tonight with the details. Scott. Well, Michelle, this is not the first time that James Forcillo has taken this stand. When it comes to this coroner's inquest, he told jurors today he's not sure if he has anything to offer that might be helpful. But he did say whatever it is he can offer, he hopes will help prevent an incident like this from ever happening again. On the sixth day of the inquest into the death of Sammy Yatim, jurors heard from the man responsible for that death. James Forcillo, no longer a police officer, was a constable with Toronto Police Service on the night of July 27, 2013. In testifying about his career with TPS, Forcillo only had vague recollections of being flagged in 2011 for a tendency to be brusque when dealing with members of the public and didn't recall being directed to speak with a supervisor as part of an early intervention program. Forcillo told jurors there was, quote, nothing sinister about five use of force alerts he caused in 2012, saying it was a fluke and called himself a bit of a magnet when it came to use of force incidents, acknowledging that he often just happened to be the first officer on scene, as he was that faithful night, something that had happened in previous incidents with less lethal consequences. 18-year-old Yatim was alone holding a small knife on a downtown streetcar when he was shot multiple times by Forcillo. When asked if there was anything that would have helped him make better decisions on the night of the shooting, Forcillo said, a taser. A taser would have changed everything. At that point, only frontline supervisors worked with the tasers. That particular night, there was a real shortage of supervisors. And when you need a taser, you need it right now. You don't need it in five, ten minutes, right? So having had just a taser, none of us would have been here. Priscilla was convicted of attempted murder and sentenced to six and a half years in prison. He was paroled in 2020 and remains on parole until May. The inquest is being held to examine how police respond to calls involving people in mental health crisis, to determine how to improve line of duty decision making, and to strengthen accountability for officers whose behavior raises red flags. When asked at the end of his examination in chief if he had anything to add to the inquiry, Forcillo said, Truthfully, I have testified, as I said, at length during my criminal trial. I was on the stand for five days. I've spoken about it at my parole hearing. I haven't been a police officer, like actually on the road, in over a decade. I genuinely don't know what I have to add to this inquest, so I'm hoping that we can look forward, as you told me, and do something so that these types of incidents don't happen again. And that really is the point of this inquest. It is not about finding fault or blame. That has been dealt with in the criminal trial. It's about making sure that something like this never happens again. The lawyers involved in this have all been told explicitly by the judge about the parameters. There was some question about what questions were appropriate to ask Forsilla this afternoon. So the judge called off the testimony a little early. But Forsilla will be back on the stand tomorrow morning. Morning Live, I'm Scott Lightfoot. Michelle, back to you. Thank you, Scott. Next to terrifying moments at a North York secondary school, reports of a machete attack this afternoon. Students at Northview Heights placed in a lockdown. CTV's Beth McDonnell is at the school near Bathurst and Finch with the details. What can you tell us, Beth? Michelle, they were some scary moments here near the corner of Bathurst and Finch in North York. Police say there was a report of a person with a machete and a suspect wearing a horror movie ski mask. The violence played out around 3.30 this afternoon, just meters from Northview Heights Secondary School, which sent the school into lockdown for about an hour. Toronto police have blocked off part of a field and the sidewalk along Finch while they investigate. Officers say initially there were reports of two people hurt in this attack, but only one person was located, uh, in, including um, a suspect involving that white horror movie ski mask. And police say that suspect also had a black Nike checkered um, clothing and uh, was out. there was someone with outside carrying a duffel bag. We spoke to students after the lockdown was lifted. All of a sudden we just hear school is under lockdown and then we hear like at least like seven sirens going off. So we're just like, what's going on? So we're just like trying to get everyone inside. It was shocking. It happened around here too. 
right? Almost right in front of the school too, which is crazy. It was pretty stressful, but we hope the guys or the person is all right. I would not want to be out if someone was going stabbing around people. I would rather be safe in a locked room where I know I'll be okay. I think the school handled it pretty well. Later this afternoon, police updated the suspect description saying uh, a male was wearing all black clothing along with a black toque and black gloves and runners with yellow accents. Reporting live, I'm Beth McDonnell. Back to Michelle and Nathan. Thank you, Beth. We turn to the loss of a giant of the screen. Legendary Canadian director Norman Jewison has died at the age of 97. Known for taking movie, lover, movie lovers from the roof to the moon. CTV's Andrea Case joins us now with a look at his career and how he's being remembered tonight, Andrea. Raheem and Michelle, good evening. A member of the Royal Canadian Navy, a World War II vet who saw segregation firsthand in his travels after he left the military, and it influenced his work. The Directors Guild of America called Norman Jewison a warrior and a champion, always ready to defend his fellow directors. A vibrant force. He was one of the most influential filmmakers of our lifetime. Norman Jewison was born in Toronto, but his films told international tales. From Fiddler on the Roof, the story of Jews fleeing persecution from the Russians, to the socially conscious film In the Heat of the Night, to the love story Moonstruck. Snap out of it! Jewison's films received 46 Oscar nominations and 12 Academy Awards. In 1999, he was bestowed with the Irving G. Thalberg Award at the Academy Awards. So just tell stories that move us to laughter and tears and perhaps reveal a little truth about ourselves. He also worked on the small screen in Britain, in Canada and the U.S. TV specials included those with Harry Belafonte and Judy Garland. <laughs> Last September, the cinema at the Hazleton Hotel in Yorkville was named after Jewison and CTV conducted his final interview. Well, I'm glad you came because this is a historic moment, you know. I'm here, and uh, 97 years old, and I'm so grateful to have a to have a screening room named in my honor. One of his lasting legacies is the Canadian Film Centre. Executive Director Maxine Bailey spoke about his influence in September. He's just. He's amazing. He's just an amazing human, very smart, very generous. And he saw a need for us to train Canadians so that they could get on the international market. And we're just trying to continue the work that Norman started. I wasn't that knocked out with the opening night film. I found it was uh, kind of relentless, the storytelling. Uh, it assaulted me a little bit. Jusen was also a scholar of film and a film fan. Oh! <laughs> All I could think of, all I could think of was the documentary. I thought, oh my God, where's it coming from? Uh, I, you know, I, I just, uh, it was just one of those films that, that, that just lifted me. His films lifted, spoke to, and affected us all. Norman Jewison was 97. Love that guy. Jewison is survived by his wife, Lynn, and three children and five grandchildren. A celebration of life will be held in Los Angeles and Toronto at a later date. Reporting for CTV News, I'm Andrea Case. Michelle, I'll send it back to you. Thank you, Andrea. And you can read more about Norman Jewison's life and legacy on our website, ctvnewstoronto.ca. We turn to the ongoing efforts to fight auto theft, not only in the GTA, but right across the country. There have been double-digit increases in the crime, prompting reaction from the federal government. Our John Woodward has been following this issue very closely, and he joins us live now with the latest. John. Now, Michelle, the federal government is calling for a national summit on auto theft, which has some in the industry hoping this could lead to better federal safety standards that could make these cars a little bit harder to steal. Another day, another multi-million dollar stolen vehicle bust near Toronto. This time, York Regional Police discovered 52 stolen vehicles worth $3.2 million. Thieves targeting high-end vehicles and trafficking them in shipping containers as far away as Azerbaijan and Georgia. It's always, uh, it's always a little startling and amazing when you open up these cargo containers and you just see these stolen vehicles sitting there getting ready to be shipped overseas. 
Shipping containers take Canadian cars all over the world. This Toyota Highlander was stolen from Ottawa, and CTV News tracked it to the streets of Nigeria, where it wasn't the only one in the lot with Canadian plates. This is happening from coast to coast. There's certainly international implications. The federal government says auto thefts are up 50% in Quebec, 48% in Ontario, 34% in Atlantic Canada, and 18% in Alberta. In Toronto alone, 12,170 vehicles were stolen last year, 20 25% more than the year before, and carjackings in the greater Toronto area more than doubled. It's a bit of a cat and mouse game that we're playing with organized crime. In some cases, thieves have broken into people's homes to get their car keys while the people are home. One of the things that concerns all of us is it's increasingly uh, becoming a violent crime uh, where people are assaulted uh, in the process of stealing vehicles. One thing the industry hopes for, an upgrade for vehicle standards. The immobilizer cut auto theft rates when it was required by the feds in the 2000s. Thieves can trick it now, and rates are shooting back up. My dream scenario would be the vehicle harder to steal in the first place. Harder to steal, which could be a bigger blow to the black market worth $1.2 billion a year than many busts that have to catch up with these cars before they're gone. There are plenty of ideas out there to replace that now obsolete immobilizer. So, for example, your phone generally requires a passcode to get in. Why not a car? Uh, many of the cars we've reported on survived that, that have survived an attempt to steal them often have an aftermarket device, and that's another template that could be used. So this uh, summit is uh, slated for February 8th in Ottawa, inviting a, a range of police industry uh, executives and insurance people, and they've got their work cut out for them. Reporting live, I'm John Woodward. Raheem, back to you. Thank you, John. A vandalism attempt at an eastern Ontario restaurant did not go exactly as planned. Call it poetic justice. The incident was caught on security camera. Check this out. This surveillance footage shows three people approaching the entrance of a business in Trenton. One of them picks up a large planter box on the sidewalk and tries to throw it at the restaurant. As they lift the box, as you saw right there, they stumble and fall to the ground, spilling a heap of soil on top of them. The group leaves, but one of them returns to put the ba box back in place. The restaurant owner filed a report with OPP. Balking at the budget. Members of the public are speaking out about the city's spending and proposed double-digit tax hike, plus the threat of which services could suffer if council doesn't budge. But first, let's take a live look outside on this Monday evening. Certainly a gray day. Fortunately, not too chilly for this time of year. Periods of snow here and there. Nothing too bothersome. But take note, more snow is on the way for tomorrow. Let's have a peek at the satellite radar at this hour. And you can see to the northwest and to the, to the northeast, rather, and to the southwest, there's some heavier stuff towards Peterborough and Hamilton. But here in Toronto, just a little bit of bands of flurries on and off today. Nothing, uh, you know, nothing too big. Accumulations about two centimeters possible tonight. Right now, the temperature, we just dropped a degree. It's minus one in the city of Toronto, feeling like minus seven with the wind chill. A bit warmer out Niagara Falls with two degrees. And overnight at a glance, anticipate some flurries. Cloudy conditions will drop to minus three tomorrow morning. Minus three when you step out the door. But when you do head out the door, plan for some snow. We'll break down what's heading our way a little later in the newscast. But now to a move impacting hundreds of thousands of international students hoping to come to Canada to study. The federal government is dramatically cutting the number of visa it issues in an effort to address things like housing and the cost of living. CTV Sean Lethong joins us live with the details. Sean. Well, Raheem and Michelle, we've heard that the best officials have said it needs to change. International students entering Canada is about to go down by 35% with Minister of Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Mark Miller announcing a two-year cap. It would be a disservice to welcome international students in Canada knowing not all of them are getting the resources they need to succeed in Canada. In 2023, the number of international study permits granted was over 550,000. That number will shrink to 364,000 this year. The reduction will be based on population within each province. Uh, but the provinces that have been most heavily affected will have to decrease, decrease by about 50 uh, and, and, and perhaps even fit more than 50 percent. Since 2015, the number of international study permit holders in Canada has jumped from just over 350,000 in 2015 to over 800,000 in 2022. 
Many colleges charge two to three times higher tuition for international students, with some programs costing in excess of $10,000 per semester. Speaking from the cabinet retreat in Montreal, the minister saying that the two-year cap will allow government to address institutions and bad actors who are charging exorbitantly high tuition for international students. I'm not surprised because there's a lot of students over here. Few houses, everything's expensive. At Seneca College today, some international students say they welcome the plan. People will think now, okay, why they're doing this? Maybe I shouldn't come here or something. So I think it's better. I just think there's a lot of international students coming in here, so it's just overpopulated. We have seen cases of international students um, uh, living um, out on the street of 16 people in a basement apartment. Um, you know, these are deplorable conditions. Brampton Mayor Patrick Brown saying changes must include a housing plan. If international students are such a cash cow, an ATM, for the academic sector, the least the academic sector can do. The, the bare minimum should be to ensure there's proper housing. While the Migrant Workers Alliance for Change says this program unfairly punishes vulnerable students. We all want to live in a fair society, and a fair society is simply one in which everybody has the same rights. Students enrolled in master's and PhD programs are exempt from the cap. The minister did not say what the cap will be in 2025. The minister also said that some public institutions had been chronically underfunded by the provinces. And they said that some private institutions are really where they need to look and that they're charging huge tuition fees and not offering much of an education. He said those institutions need to be shut down. Reporting live, I'm Sean Leethong. Raheem, I'll send it back to you. Thank you, Sean. Budget talks continue today at Toronto City Hall. Property owners are facing a proposed 10.5% tax hike. It comes as councillors work to rein in spending, generating lots of debate over cuts and frontline services. Our Mike Walker has been monitoring all the deliberations today. He joins us live with the latest. Mike. Well, Michelle Rahim, 90 people registered to speak to the Budget Committee today, including interest groups and unions representing police and paramedics who raised some concerns about the funding for their services in the budget, as well as staffing and response times. The city must give our members the tools and resources they need. The Toronto Police Association president speaking out against a $12.6 million cut from the force's requested budget, arguing it will continue to impact staffing and increase response times. For us to take 22 minutes to get to a 911 call is unacceptable to our members. Supporting a call made by the police chief just last week for the city to fulfill the requested $1.186 billion budget. Population is growing by almost 460,000 people. And we need to make sure we have the uh, equipment, resources, staffing to do that. We're losing approximately 225 police officers a year. Outside the committee meeting, advocates calling on the city not to increase the police budget. We need a budget that commits to, ser to services like health care, free education, affordable housing and public transportation. An increase in policing will only criminalize our communities. The union representing Toronto paramedics also sounding the alarm over the ongoing staffing challenges, pointing to 57 resignations last year. Never in my 33 years as a paramedic have I seen such hemorrhaging of staff and the inability to replace them. Stating the increase to the EMS budget and a proposal to hire more than 60 paramedics is not enough. When our call volume goes up 4.5% a year, and I'm not even sure that 4.4 is all targeted for frontline staff. The request from union leaders comes as a historic 10.5% property tax increase is on the table. Some residents speaking in support of it. We need recreation facilities and parks to keep active. We need supports to remain in our communities for as long as possible. The city states it's found more than $600 million in savings, but amid the belt tightening efforts, more requests to fund programs, including a poverty reduction strategy. That have concrete funded actions to address the challenges of low-income Torontonians. A call made by the head of the Daily Bread Food Bank with one in 10 Torontonians relying on food banks. We urge the city to continue making public transit more affordable for low-income residents. Only 39% of eligible residents who access food banks actually receive the Fair Pass Transit Program discount. Given all the funding requests, the budget chief says the committee will continue to look for efficiencies. If there are different funding sources that, are, that uh, should arise, we list those. As it intends to make its recommendations to the mayor at the end of the week. 
And the public will have two more opportunities to weigh in on the budget. Tomorrow, there will be meetings at the Civic Centers in North York and Etobicoke. Reporting live, I'm Mike Walker. Raheem, back to you. Thank you, Mike. Transit advocates are calling on the City of Toronto and the province to move faster on building a dedicated busway in Scarborough. The call comes after a derailment last year that forced the early shutdown of the now decommissioned Scarborough RT. TTC riders say the closure has added 20 minutes to commute time. And to underscore the fact it takes longer to get where you're going, they presented an oversized invoice at the city's budget committee today. What we want is funding for it in the city budget now, and then we'll ask for, this, for the funding for the province later because that's going to take time and we need to get this started right away. People should always have the resources that they need. It shouldn't be like a struggle to get them every time. So Yeah, yeah. especially we'll accessibility-wise and like... Uh, you know, how often buses come on time and how often buses are late. Uh, you really never know how long it's going to take you to get to where you need to go. The TTC riders point out that a new TTC report has revealed that the busway construction has been delayed by over one year. The project was supposed to be complete by the end of 2025. To Queen's Park, where the premier is defending a controversial move to put Service Ontario counters in big box stores. Kiosks are being added in some staples and Walmart. Doug Ford says it's about saving money and improving service. But as CTV's Queen's Park Bureau Chief Siobhan Morris reports, opposition leaders are raising concerns about deals they say are being done behind closed doors. To-do list items like renewing your driver's license or health card could be coming to a Staples or Walmart store near you. The Premier speaking on the controversial plan for the first time today. We are not touching government-run uh, stores at all, but it's, it's convenience. The government has said that some Service Ontario counters will close, but be replaced with kiosks in retail centres, which Doug Ford suggests might be a better fit. Not everyone can make it in to... Uh, into one of the outlets from whatever nine o'clock till five. I think the, gov the premier is concocting excuses as usual, making all kinds of excuses uh, when he's caught. The premier says the new service Ontario kiosks will be open as late as nine or 10 p.m. and the government will chip in taxpayer money to set them up. Just like we pay for the infrastructure for the other stores, we're going to help them. But at the end of the day, it's saving the taxpayers over a million dollars and it's going to expand the hours and convenience. While the NDP leader says, sure, we could talk about better hours for key services. Did he ever have a conversation with any of the other Service Ontario locations about, or anybody else, about how we could make uh, those services available to people? The government isn't answering any of CTV's questions on this Service Ontario change, about how it will all roll out, how they arrived at that million dollars in savings, and how much they'll spend on renovations. What it isn't is transparent, and I think this government has really lost the right to sole source um, different contracts without consulting with people, without showing us the business case, without doing their homework. The Greens want the Auditor General to crunch the numbers on these deals. These are wealthy, you know, big box mega corporations. I think they can likely pay for their own renovations. And I think we need honest answers on whether taxpayers are getting good value for money. Siobhan Morris, CTV News. Still to come tonight, a new Bombardier plant about to fully take flight at Pearson. We'll take you inside from the factory floor to the sky. Diplomatic talks are underway between Canada and Mexico over a growing number of asylum claims. They have gone up dramatically in recent years because of families fleeing violence, insecurity and a lack of jobs. Ottawa says options are being examined but did not provide details. Last week, Quebec warned its services for refugees are reaching a breaking point. In the Middle East, Israel is reportedly proposing a pause in the fighting with Hamas for up to two months. Axio says the multi-phase deal would include the release of all remaining hostages held in Gaza. Family members and supporters called today for a deal to release the hostages. The protest took place near the residence of Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu in Jerusalem. Earlier, dozens of family members stormed a committee meeting in Israel's parliament demanding a deal. In Montreal, Canada's foreign affairs minister spoke about the impact the war is having on people here. I've never seen an issue in the world that has been so difficult to deal with for Canadians. And my point is, is... We need to be able to talk to one another. 
We need to be able to listen to one another. At the end of the day, we need to be able to trust one another. Jolie says Canada is continuing to follow the case at the International Court of Justice. It is considering South Africa's allegation that Israel is committing genocide against Palestinians in the Gaza Strip. It is a monumental task, but the last remaining challenger to Donald Trump is looking for a strong showing in New Hampshire as Republicans decide who will be their presidential nominee. CTV's Joy Malbin reports. Here in Manchester is just one day away from the New Hampshire primary, but even before the voting begins, the race may already be over. After his blowout win in Iowa, polls show Donald Trump is the Republican favorite. And now that Florida Governor Ron DeSantis has bowed out, Trump's chances just got even better. DeSantis was the guy who had the best shot at defeating Trump. He staked his entire campaign on Iowa and came in a distant second. Now DeSantis is endorsing Trump, the man he tried to beat. Trump is superior to the current incumbent, Joe Biden. That is clear. I signed a pledge to support the Republican nominee. So guess where his supporters are likely to go? Along with some big name endorsements like South Carolina Senator Tim Scott, they seem to be falling in line. And that makes it harder for Nikki Haley to topple Trump. It's an uphill battle for her. One advantage here, independents can vote in this primary, not just Republicans. And if enough of the not Trump voters can break for her, it could propel her to the next contest in South Carolina. America doesn't do coronations. We believe in choices. We believe in democracy and we believe in freedom. So let's get everybody out to vote. As for Donald Trump, he's splitting his time, holding rallies here and appearing at his defamation trial. Court was canceled today because a juror was sick. On the campaign trail, Haley is hoping for a big turnout. Here is her last best chance to stop the former president. I like Nikki Haley. She's a strong woman. She um, should be a strong leader. I don't think it's her time. Um, I think Trump has some things he's got to finish. Trump wants to deliver a knockout blow against Haley and wrap up the nomination race here, even before the rest of the states have a chance to vote. We'll see what New Hampshire does on Tuesday night. Joy Melvin, CTV News, Manchester, New Hampshire. Back here at home, a new aircraft manufacturing facility is about to take flight near Pearson International Airport. The Bombardier plan is expected to fully open in a few months, and today, CTV's Janice Golden got a look inside. The Global 7500 flies at Mach 0.925, so simply put, that's almost the speed of sound. You're looking at some highlights of Bombardier's new state-of-the-art Global Aircraft Assembly Center. So these are our robots, okay? So these robots we invested in, and what they do is they automatically install, they drill, deburr, install sealant, and install fasteners in a single move, in a single motion. The 770,000 square foot facility houses a state-of-the-art business jet assembly line and replaces Bombardier's Downsview Manufacturing Center that was built in the 1960s. The 770,000 square feet facility sits on 41 acres of land and includes two purpose-built facilities. This one, 650,000 square feet final assembly building and 120,000 flight test hangar next door. Bombardier says the new assembly center at Pearson International Airport, which is nine times smaller than its Downsview site, will reduce its industrial and environmental footprint. Aside from the obvious technology and economic benefits, this new manufacturing center is also a superb example of climate conscious land use and design. The facility is expected to have a carbon footprint less than half of that at the former Downsview site. As a company, Bombardier is such an important part of our economy here in the GTA and right across the country. It's a company that drives innovation and growth and accelerates te technical advancements. Bombardier employs 2,000 people, 1,200 of whom have already moved from the Downsview facility and have begun working on the production line. You're looking at one of the three types of aircrafts being manufactured here, a $105 million Global 7500 jet. The longest flight is capable of just over 8,000 nautical miles or 17 hours, the distance between Sydney, Australia and Detroit, Michigan. Soon, we'll be building the Global 8000, the world's fastest and longest range business jet right here again in this, in this facility. We're going to make history again in this building.
we put our engines on the back of the plane instead of under the wings is simply so that when you're operating an aircraft of this scale, uh, engines above the wings allow you to have shorter landing gear. Bombardier sold its Downsview site in 2018 for about $635 million to the Public Sector Pension Investment Board, and construction on the new facility began in 2019. It's expected to be fully operational by late spring or summer. Janice Golding, CTV News. She's known for her high energy and sense of humor. Now actor Mary Walsh is opening up about her battle with alcohol and reshaping the conversation of mental health to better her health moving forward. And I'm Pat Foran. Coming up on Consumer Alert, there's a new scam going around that involves fake parking tickets. You could get a text message saying you owe money, and if you don't pay right away, you'll lose your license. It's a scam. I'll have the details just ahead. Mostly cloudy in Toronto this hour. Light snow possible here and there. If you're out and about tomorrow, you will want to factor in a dose of snow. To what extent? Well, here you go. This is our snowfall accumulation map. And if we move it forward, this is what we're in for heading into first thing on Wednesday. So for Toronto, five centimeters possible, a little more to the south and west in the Hamilton area. It really is going to depend on the temperature, which uh, we are in for a warm up. We'll break it all down for you after the break. And also stay with us. We do have another full night of great shows for you right here on CTV. Toronto police are warning about a new scam where residents are being sent fake notices for parking violations. You're told to pay the ticket right away or you'll lose your license. But officials say it's part of a phishing scam. Here's Pat Foran and Consumer Alert. Pat. Thanks, Raheem and Michelle. Residents have been telling us about the fake parking ticket scam. You could also get a fake speeding ticket. They will come as a text on your phone, which is something the police don't do. I was happy I didn't fall into the trap. John Brooker of Toronto recently got a text message saying he had a parking ticket and that if he didn't pay it, his license would be revoked. They threatened uh, that uh, if I didn't do it, it, then my license would be taken away and all sorts of things, bad things would happen. Brooker clicked on the link in the text message but grew suspicious when he was asked to provide his personal information. It went to another page which asked for a whole bunch of information, personal information and information about the car. Brooker didn't continue and deleted the text. Toronto police say they don't contact people using text messages. It's a classic fraud where it has a sense of urgency behind it. It has threats of suspension behind it. And that's not the way government works. It's not the way the Toronto police work. So they're absolutely fraud. Clicking on the link could give scammers access to your phone and providing your information could lead to identity theft. There are variations of the parking ticket scam. You could also get a text saying you owe money for a speeding ticket or other traffic violation. The Toronto police, the traffic services, court services will not send text messages reminding people of overdue traffic uh, violations. So delete it. Uh, do not respond to it. Worker is relieved he didn't get scammed and says he contacted CTV News to warn others. And another viewer told us she got a text from the 407 saying she owed money, but she doesn't even own a car. Anytime you get a strange text saying you owe funds, chances are it's a scam. On your side, I'm Pat Ford. If you have a consumer story idea, email us at alert at ctv.ca. Rain the most reliable heating and cooling brand. It's hard to stop a train. Well, I'm sure a lot of us are happy that we escaped that deep freeze from last week. Unfortunately, though, we don't have much way in the way of sunshine today, and we're also dealing with a bit of snow. There's barely any sun this <laughs> week. Maybe a little bit, peaks of it by the weekend. But yeah, this is actually an active work week. The good news is, if you really want it to warm up a bit, it will throughout the week. But it's going to be messy at times. Let's take you through what's headed our way in the days ahead. Currently this hour, minus one in Toronto, minus one in Windsor, but feeling with the wind chill like minus seven. So here's the satellite radar and you can see snow across parts of southern Ontario. If we zone in closer, here's what's heading our way for your Tuesday. So it's going to stop around noon Tuesday. So really mid to later morning, like nine o'clock, the snow should start to come into our region. Uh, it'll impact your drive a little bit there. And then really we've got the bulk of it 
it around uh, noon. If we play it forward, it pushes through throughout the day right into Tuesday evening and then tapers off by Wednesday. But you can see that's the, the pink and the green. That's where the temperature is going to warm up and you'll be dealing more with mixing in rain. Tonight's lows, minus 3 degrees, feeling like minus 7. This is pretty good for this time of year. It could be a lot colder. Tomorrow, the high reaching the freezing mark. So 0 degrees, but with the wind making it feel like minus 3 in Toronto. A little warmer, 1 degree in Niagara Falls, minus 1 in Peterborough, minus 1 in Aurelia. Your seven day forecast breaks down like this. So tomorrow plan for periods of snow two to four centimeters happening throughout the day. The high is zero degrees, so it won't be too cold, but it could be messy at times. It could affect your drive. Then into Wednesday, we warm up quite a bit more. The high four degrees forecast showers expected in the afternoon, mid to late afternoon and continue into Thursday. There's a chance of showers as it warms up even more to a high of five degrees. Calms down for your Friday, six degrees. I mean, that's well above seasonal. The norm for this time of year is minus two degrees. And Saturday, Sunday, there's a bit of sunshine, breaks in the cloud, but really mostly cloudy days for your weekend and comfortable for this time of year. Highs of three and one degree. And Monday looking decent for January as well. Well, with Canada's aging population, the number of people living with dementia is on the rise. The troubling trend expected to become reality by 2050 and what can be done about it. The focus is on mental health this week, with Bell Let's Talk Day beginning marked, being marked on Wednesday. Actress Mary Walsh is known for creating energetic and hilarious characters, but off screen, she's been equally outspoken as a mental health advocate. CTV's health reporter Pauline Chan has more. Delahunty, you know, I gave up all the old princess warrior stuff. Mary Walsh is a beloved Canadian comic genius, but since her own battle with alcoholism some three decades ago, she's been keenly aware and open about her own mental health needs every single day every single day i have uh, you know i have my own recovery uh you know and uh, and um, addiction and alcoholism are a mental physical and spiritual it's a mental physical and spiritual disease and when bell let's talk day began she was an early spokesperson now we've got people talking but what we need is we need mental health services which just seem to be very paltry all across the country, you know, it, it, in, in St. John's, it could take an adolescent 18 months to see a, a therapist. We spend most of our money on 3% of the mental health issues because that those are the really bad mental health issues where you have to be hospitalized, where you need, uh, you know, doctor's care 24 hours a day. That's 3%. 97% of mental health issues can sometimes be treated like in a, a walk-in clinic. She says she was fortunate to find and respond well to treatment for her addiction and also anxiety. And she likens the stigma about mental illness to that about cancer 50 years ago. My message would be is to turn toward and to be open and to help, even though it is frightening, you know, but once upon a time, people were frightened of people with cancer. And she's grateful to add her voice to the message of Let's Talk. It's so great to feel that maybe you might make one tiny, tiny little bit of difference if one person got the message and sought help. Pauline Chan, CTV News. Bell Let's Talk Day is this Wednesday. It's a day of conversation surrounding mental health. To learn how to get involved and make a positive difference, you can read about the campaign at letstalk.bell.ca. Bell is the parent company of CTV. A study by the Alzheimer's Society of Canada indicates the demographics of dementia are quickly changing. It calls for diagnosis and care that considers cultural background. Trying to look at these different populations and address those needs not only just for language, but try really getting an understanding of how they think about dementia and how it best can be communicated to them. How can we best educate people and set up supports for those individuals? The study says those with Asian ancestry might be particularly vulnerable. An estimated 650,000 Canadians live with dementia, a term used to describe 50 different brain diseases. By the year 2050, that number is expected to jump to 1.7 million. 
Meanwhile, another new study suggests a simple blood test could screen for Alzheimer's disease even before a patient has any symptoms. The test looks like one of several proteins. Right now, that type of testing involves brain scans or spinal taps, but the study found the new blood test was just as accurate, and one of the authors says it should be available for clinical use soon. The study was published in the journal JAMA Neurology. Cameroon began the world's first routine vaccine program against malaria today. Doses of the RTSS vaccine are meant to work alongside existing tools such as bed nets to combat the mosquito-borne disease. It kills nearly half a million children under the age of five each year in Africa. 19 other countries intend to roll out a similar vaccine program this year. It's hoped more than six and a half million children can be inoculated through to 2025. The younger son of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. has passed away. Dexter Scott King died at the age of 62 after battling prostate cancer. He was named for the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Montgomery, Alabama, where his father once served as pastor. Dexter Scott King became chairman of the King Center, dedicating much of his life to shepherding the civil rights legacy of his parents. Avril Lavigne has announced the Canadian dates for her upcoming Greatest Hits tour. Levine will be in Toronto August 16th at Budweiser Stage. It's part of a 27-day journey across North America. The tour begins May 22nd in Vancouver and will feature songs that defined her career. Tickets go on sale to the general public on Friday. The Stars Tonight is brought to you by Lastman's Bad Boy, court-approved liquidation sale. On the next CP24 Breakfast. Chef Frank Parhizgar from the Michelin Guide recommended FK Restaurant will be here with tips on making an award-winning dish. CP24 Breakfast up first at 5.30. Updating our top stories, the former Toronto police officer convicted of killing Semi Atim testified at the inquest into the teen's death today. When asked if there was anything that could have helped him make better decisions on the night of Yatim's death, James Forsillo stated, a taser would have changed everything. All of a sudden we just hear, school is under lockdown, and then we hear like at least like seven sirens going off. One person is in hospital with serious but non-life-threatening injuries after a masked suspect was reportedly seen carrying a machete in a North York neighborhood. The victim was found in the area of Bathurst and Finch around 3.30. A nearby school was briefly under lockdown due to the incident, and the suspect remains at large. Norman Jewison, one of Canada's greatest film directors, has died at the age of 97. Jewison, who was born and raised in Toronto, won the Academy Award for Best Director three times. His 1967 film, In the Heat of the Night, also won the Academy Award for Best Picture. Remember to keep up today, day and night, through our website, ctvnewstoronto.ca. On the markets, the Canadian dollar is down by about a quarter of a cent to 74.18 U.S. American benchmark oil added 150 to almost $75 a barrel. And TSX Composite Index gained 17 points to end the day at 20,924. Toronto's tourism industry still hasn't recovered to pre-COVID levels. The latest report from Destination Toronto shows the city welcomed nearly 9 million visitors last year, which was 93% of pre-pandemic levels. Demand for accommodation also remains well below what the city was seeing back in 2019. Domestic travelers made up 71% of visitors as international tourism lags behind. U.S. visitor rates remained at 25% below 2019 levels. Levels. The Business Report is brought to you by Canadian Western Bank, the bank built for business. The NHL's ultimate prize is touring the city. The Stanley Cup is in Toronto with fans able to get an up-close look and a chance to win tickets to the upcoming All-Star Game. Tonight, major shifts in the demographics of dementia. We have now arrived in this pivotal moment. Researchers project a 187% increase by 2050. We'll have that story and more later on CTV National News. And a reminder, the CTV News at 6 podcast is available as a download every weeknight. And a special shout out to those of you listening to the newscast live on News Talk 1010.
A special surprise was waiting for some TTC commuters today. Lord Stanley went underground for a ride on the subway. Right here. Yeah, that's it. Let's do it. Former Maple Leaf Thomas Caberlet accompanied the Stanley Cup for a trip on line one of the TTC. The car was decked out with NHL All-Star signage as the stunt promoted the event here in Toronto. The iconic trophy traveled from Davisville Station to Union, where the former defenseman and Stanley Cup champ brought it onto the concourse for fans to have a close-up look. Honestly, I was waiting at the stop on Young and Bloor, and I saw just all these lights and cameras on one of the carriages. So I was like, I never see that, so I ran to get this carriage, even though I had no idea what was going on. And then, uh, yeah, this was happening, and I saw the trophy, and I saw the player, and yeah, I just went with whatever was happening, I guess. It was fun. I've never seen this stuff on a train before. Toronto will host the All-Star Weekend from February 1st to 3rd. Light snow falling in the city of Toronto this hour, but if you look at the radar, you will see we're being spared the substantial stuff for now. The school day forecast when you walk out the door, some flurries tomorrow, minus three by noon periods of snow. That's when we get the heavier stuff, and it'll continue. So your drive home tomorrow could involve uh, some snow as well. Two to four centimeters expected for Tuesday, the high zero. Wednesday, it warms up. Look at the high, four degrees, so we're expecting some afternoon showers. Possible for showers Thursday as well, the high of five. And then look at Friday, cloudy and six degrees. We even get a little bit of sun for your weekend, and it is mild for this time of year. So the weekend looks like one to enjoy. That's it for us, but be sure to join Omar Sachedina tonight at 11 for CTV National News, followed by Natalie Johnson with the next local newscast at 1130. In the meantime, our coverage continues anytime on CP24 and online at ctvnewstoronto.ca. For all of us here at CTV News, thank you for watching and have a great night.